Cell phones, pages, blackberries, camera speakers, space heaters, bureau phones. That seems to be working here.
Good afternoon. Um, just a quick uh, comment on an issue that I know people are interested in, and I'm unfortunately not going to have a lot more detail beyond what I tell you. And then I'll ask uh, General Conway to uh, make a few comments. We'll be happy to take some questions. There's obviously um, some interest this week in the uh, global posture uh, work that we've done in the department. There's a congressional commission or a Senate commission that's made some recommendations recently. Uh, we're obviously completing our our uh, submission for the 2005 base realignment enclosure uh, enclosure uh, report. Uh, that process has obviously gotten until, according to the statute, May 16th for the secretary to send the department's recommendation to the commission. Uh, today is May 11th, I guess, 10th. So we're obviously in a window where we're getting close to making a, a, a completing a final submission, but we're not 
concluded with that process. Uh, we are uh, developing that draft, and we, have, as I said, have until the 16th of May to submit it for the Secretary to submit the Department's recommendations to the Commission. We will meet that goal uh, as a target. We hope to complete that this week, uh, by the end of the week, but our, object, our, our requirement is to complete it by May 16th, and we will meet that objective. And uh, I, I'm as much interest as I know there is in this, I'm not going to have a lot more to say about that uh, because that's that's where we stand at the moment. Uh, General Conway, do you have any? I do. Thank you, Larry. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, first of all. Uh, I'd like to extend my condolences uh, to the, the families and friends of those soldiers, Marines, sailors, airmen, who have recently uh, uh, made the ultimate sacrifice uh, as we continue the, the war on terrorism. Secondly, uh, I would uh, announce to you folks that multinational forces uh, continue Operation Matador uh, in the western portion of the Al Anbar province. Uh, the mission is to eliminate insurgents and foreign fighters uh, in this region uh, that's known for its smuggling uh, and as a recent location for foreign fighters and insurgents. Uh, recently, uh, Iraqis have taken over uh, the Iraqi tips hotline uh, from U.S. forces in Baghdad where Iraqi civilians can anonymously uh, report criminal and insurgent activity. Uh, in the first week of operation under Iraqi control, we find that the numbers uh, of calls that have provided substantive information have increased tenfold. Uh, and we see that as a testament to the determination of those Iraqis who want to see a, a safe and stable country. In the Kalat region uh, of Afghanistan, coalition forces uh, are working a significant ammunition cache, uh, which at this point includes more than 2,000 mortar rounds and over 1,000 recoilless rifle rounds, certainly uh, the makings of IEDs, and, and the, uh, the evacuation of that ordinance continues. With that, uh, I think we'll take your questions. Uh, Larry, I realize I might be heading down a dead end here, but um, <laughs> is Secretary Rumsfeld currently reviewing that draft list that you that you mentioned uh, of bases recommended for closure and can you say how many may be on that list and also is the announcement definitely Friday will you have hit a dead end and I apologize <laughs> uh, it is not definitely Friday uh, and as I said the process is that the secretary will sign will com will complete a report sign that report on behalf of the department and submit it to the commission and our legal obligation is that be done not later than May 16th Podium yesterday. Sure. It's no, and I appreciate that. And it is our uh, our goal to get that done this week. But we have till the 16th. We will meet our, our statutory obligations. And I just, as I said, I'm not going to be able to say a lot more than that. And I, and I appreciate the interest in it. Brad. General, can you describe the resistance uh, the Marines are seeing out on, along the border and, and talk about uh, uh, the enemy they're, they're facing? Uh, I can't. Let me, let me give you some uh, geographical context if I can. Of course, uh, Husayba butts up against the Syrian border. Uh, just southeast of there is the town of al Qaim. We've had a battalion out there for, for a long time now. Uh, recently, I think it's fair to say that the commanders have evaluated that the center of resistance in the Al Anbar has moved further west uh, since the, the fall of Fallujah. Uh, and now is in what we would call the Ramadi Hit Corridor, uh, extending westward as opposed to Ramadi Fallujah. Uh, about 72 hours ago, uh, U.S. forces, the, uh, the second regimental combat team, uh, effected a river crossing uh, at a place called uh, uh, Ukadi, uh, and they established a blocking position at a, a little townlet called uh, Ramana and put forces across the river uh, to flush what had been uh, reported groupings of insurgents there. Uh, they were decisively engaged. Uh, a fairly significant battle followed. Uh, use of close air support and combined arms have been employed, and at this point uh, the fight continues. Uh, there are reports uh, that these people uh, are in uh, uniforms, in some cases are wearing uh, protective vests, uh, and there's some suspicion that their training exceeds that of, uh, of what we have seen uh, with, with other engagements uh, further east. So at this point, the fight continues. At, um, right now, it's a, a U.S. operation. Uh, from what we understand, there aren't Iraqis there. Does that pose a problem as far as a U.S. face being on this battle along the border 
uh, that Iraqis have been very concerned about coming to you? Yeah. No, I think your assessment is correct based on my knowledge, Brett, and my observation of the task organization. Uh, I think, as you know, we do have Iraqi forces uh, based at Habaniya that are working uh, both the Fallujah and the Ramadi area. At this point, uh, those operational forces have simply not extended their reach far enough west to join the U.S. forces there. There are Iraqis operating in border forts along the borders. Uh, but in that interim area, they're simply not there yet. And I would offer that the fight's not finished. Uh, we saw where the Iraqis uh, provided tremendous value to us in Fallujah. Uh, and if the fight continues, if it does involve a fighting in built-up areas, that's not to say you won't see Iraqi forces involved. Can I follow up on that? Um, um, can you say whether or not you've seen any evidence that some of these foreign fighters, as you described them, are crossing back over the border? And are the Syrians in any way involved in this or in any way cooperating? I, I don't think I use the term foreign fighters. I don't think we know that yet. Uh, certainly it's in proximity to the border. Uh, there is a major crossing site there at Huseba, and, and again, there's smugglers' routes uh, both north and south of that location. So it's not unrealistic to expect that there could be foreign fighters engaged. Uh, at this point, we simply don't know if there's movement across the border associated with this because the preponderance of our forces are engaged in this fight. Contact with the Syrians or any sort of effort to get them to help out if need be? Uh, from an operational perspective, I can only say that there is low-level contact that uh, goes on on a continuing basis. Uh, the captains and, and, and the field grade officers of that battalion uh, have a, a fairly routine dialogue with the Syrians. I cannot speak to whether or not it transcends that. Assuming that uh, this operation is uh, successful, what do you expect the effect will be? You said that the center of the insurgency had effectively moved west. Uh, if you're able to succeed in, in this mission's objectives, what do you think the result will be? Will, it, will you have broken the back of the insurgency? Will no, I, I, think, I think it's way too early to say that. Uh, I think uh, as we have uh, experienced in every fight up to this point where we find the insurgents, we will attack them uh, to uh, capture or, or, or kill if they resist. Uh, if you look at what, happened, what has happened in the region up to this point, uh, we have had a, a fairly significant special operations operation uh, south of Al-Qaim where we, uh, we uh, captured or killed 54. Uh, we have had two engagements uh, in Huseba, uh, one the attack on Camp Gannon where they attempted to breach the perimeter uh, with a, a large uh, explosive device, the fire truck. We've had a Zarqawi sighting. Uh, and now we have this, uh, this uh, fairly significant gathering of, of insurgents. So where we find them, we will fight them to take them out. How do you explain that dur during the time when you've had these uh, successes, uh, rounding up uh, followers of Zarqawi and, ha and, and capturing or killing insurgents, it's corresponded with an increase in the number of uh, bombings, particularly the number of suicide bombings? Can you explain that at all? I don't know that the two are related. Uh, we know we're dealing with a willful uh, and capable insurgent. Uh, and he has his uh, his operational plans as well. General, what do you make of the fact that they don't seem to be running into your blocking force, but they're standing and fighting? It's an interesting development. Uh, I uh, and, and I think time will tell uh, what happens here, whether or not they will attempt now to flee the battlefield if they sense that they are surrounded uh, and, and can be sacrificed. Uh, if they are uh, intending on being martyred, uh, that has to be cranked into the equation with this particular enemy. So uh, those, those, I think, are future events that we will see unfold. Is that unusual that, that this would happen, that they wouldn't uh, just melt away? Uh, no, not if you uh, witness what happened in Fallujah. Uh, there, as many as 3,000 decided to stay. Uh, about half that number were killed and about half were captured, so it's not entirely unusual. General, uh, were you surprised by the level of organization and the skills and the, the ferocity of the fighting that the, the Marines have encountered there? And do you feel like you have enough troops on the ground there to deal with it, or do you think you need to send reinforcements? Um, let me answer your last question first and say, of course, I'm 9,000 miles away, and, and I don't have a feel for that, but I have every confidence that the commander uh, in the region, both the regimental commander and the division commander, his MEF commander, uh, will apply forces as need be uh, to be successful in this instance. Um, no, I, I don't think we're surprised. Uh, we know, again, that this is a, a determined enemy, uh, that he uh, has the, uh, the skill and the uh, ordnance, uh, the weapons, uh, to be able to resist uh, fiercely, as we're seeing here. So it should not be a surprise to us when that happens. The body armor, that sort of thing, I mean, that, that suggests a level of organization you have really haven't seen, right? We have seen that in some instances. Yeah. It, it's spotty, but we have seen it. And <laughs> uniforms. Yeah. What uniforms? Let, let me make sure it's understood. This is not a uniform, a, a, a single entity that is all in the same uniform. Okay, we are seeing some uniforms on some of the fighters. Okay. Uh, sir, 
Um, I have two questions on this. Uh, on the question of the number of troops, the Marines in Anbar province have been spread very thin since the start of this. There's not that many um, out there at all. And um, I've been talking with folks who have suggested that perhaps if there's been a greater uh, size force and it hadn't been diverted for Fallujah, more troops would prevent these things from happening because it's, it's this idea that they've been squeezed out from Fallujah and have gone and found um, vacuums where they can take up residence and then U.S. forces have to go in after them. Could you address the sort of the strategic issue of are there enough forces in general in Anbar province to prevent them from just getting squeezed out of this area and going somewhere else? Well, w once again, we have some very able commanders uh, in Baghdad uh, and in Fallujah, a number of them friends of mine, and they're making those determinations on a daily basis. A commander certainly has the ability with the mobility of U.S. and, and coalition forces uh, to flex on the battlefield and put forces where he needs to have them. Now, in the case of the Al Anbar, you make a great point. It is a huge uh, piece of, of terrain. Uh, but that said, our basing strategy at this point is to operate out of fixed locations and patrol certain sites uh, in order to accomplish just what we've done. That is, find fixed locations of enemy insurgents and then go after them. And the second question is, could you discuss this um, fairly new development of talking about enemy casualty counts? Um, Tommy Frank said we don't do body counts, and that was certainly the, the, the point in Afghanistan. But now we're hearing 100 here, 50 there. Could you well, explain why? Well, uh, you haven't heard me mention body counts because I don't think it's something that we should do as a matter of course. In this case, that number has slipped out. Uh, it has happened before. Uh, it does add perspective, but I don't think it's something we'll do as a matter of course. Why not? Why, why not do it as a matter of course? I mean, doesn't it show some sort of progress? Uh, it's, it's not a metric that I think we want to use uh, to gauge our, our relative levels of success. Thank you. Do you say so, anything about the, uh, what U.S. casualties have been suffered during this uh, operation? Um, last reports as a result of this operation are three Marines that have been killed and, and less than 20 that have been wounded. And, and I think that uh, they've been putting it out in the theater pretty regularly, and that's that's how we do it. And, it. and, again, it hasn't been our practice, but on the other hand, we've done it from time to time. Well, I mean, we've done Fallujah, 1,500. Right, it hasn't been our practice, but we do it from time General, to time. General, the 100 figure that you say slipped out, is that an accurate figure that slipped out, or what? I, I have no way of knowing that. Uh, I will say that there have been uh, significant amounts of close air strikes. When that happens, uh, I, I would offer that uh, an actual precise count is difficult. You mentioned uh, the, the nature of the air land, kind of nature of the conflict. Can you give a better feel for that in terms of our drones being used with Hellfires, helicopters, airplanes, you know, combined, uh, I, I combined think, uh, I think we need to guard against too much detail only because the operation is still ongoing. If I can just couch it as combined arms, uh, if you look at the manual how Marines fight, uh, you'll see you'll see a listing there of, of what might be involved. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sir? Mm -hmm. And then we'll come to Jeff. Uh, so, different uh, issue. There, there have been protests in Pakistan over reports that investigation over abuses in, in Guantanamo has found that guards uh, apparently uh, put Korans in the toilet. And I'm wondering if uh, either of you can comment on whether that's accurate, whether the, whether the investigation has found that, uh, and what's being done about it. <laughs> I can't speak to any particular uh, – I've not seen the reports on that specific point. Uh, as we've said many times, we have uh, conducted multiple investigations into the treatment of detainees at Guantanamo and elsewhere in the world, uh, and uh, we are facing an, an adversary in the case of uh, many of these detainees, particularly at Guantanamo, who are – exceedingly well trained in, in counter uh, interrogation tactics and uh, the procedures that, that are provided for by field manual as well as other authorization have have taken that into account but um, I can't speak to a particular uh, assertion about what uh, may at have least happened. the status of that investigation at Guantanamo which investigation this was I, I believe it was an investigation that was sparked by uh, allegations by FBI officials oh right um, that was an investigation that, uh, because of these FBI emails that we learned of, uh, the commander down there asked for uh, for it to be pursued. Uh, I, I know that the investigators down there have coordinated with the FBI, which apparently is doing its own separate investigation. The Department of Justice Inspector General is involved because there are FBI interrogators as well as other uh, as well as military. So I think where we are is that the commander is coordinating closely with the Department of Justice so that we have, we, we can be as linked together as we need to be. Uh, he, 
I think receive some the commander received some uh, initial uh, assessments early, asked for some additional inquiries, and those have not been completed. Uh, uh, and I, I think we're probably uh, b because of the desire to make sure that we're working closely with other agencies, it, it's a little bit more complicated. And I think we're probably several weeks away from being able to say that the commander has made his final assessments there. So, sorry, can I? Yeah. Uh, we'll come back. Uh, we'll come back to uh, how much do you think this low level of contact with the Syria, as you said, is helping the U.S. Uh, to maintain a sort of stability on the border with, with Iraq? And my second question is, do you, th do you still believe that the Syrian government is still hiding uh, top, top uh, Iraqis uh, Ba'athist inside Syria? I'm going to defer your second question uh, to Mr. Drea. Uh, in terms of the first question, I do think that uh, contact with the Syrians cross-border is helpful. Uh, we have had over the months now a number of cross-border firings, uh, and I know that dialogue amongst the local commanders there has helped to mitigate that uh, in time. What was, your, what was the question? Then? About the, if the Syrian government is, is still hiding top uh, Baathist, uh, Iraqis Baathist? Well, I think we've had, uh, as a government, the U.S. government has had multiple interactions with the Syrian government at multiple levels. Uh, there's no question that, that uh, we, we've made clear the concerns that we have regarding Syrian uh, support for, uh, for the foreign elements that we're finding in Iraq at some level, and whether that's a level that's official or sanctioned is beyond my purview. I just know that we've had multiple interactions be by state, led by the State Department, with the Syrian government, and it's well understood the concerns that we have. Uh, Mark, did you have something? Uh, yeah, for General Conway. Uh, I wondered if you could speak um, more broadly about Anbar Province. You deployed there twice, and as you say, they're not, you're 9,000 miles away now, but you still talk to commanders out there. Um, here we are a couple of months after the election. I'm wondering, is your sense of the province as a whole is moving closer towards the democratic process or, or acceptance of uh, Iraqi government, or does it still remain the biggest trouble spot in Iraq um, and, as you say, the, the center of the insurgency? Yeah, Mark, it's mixed. Uh, if you look at numbers of attacks, uh, there are significant numbers in what we call MND West, but there are also significant numbers in, in Baghdad and in the north as well, so uh, that, that remains a factor. Uh, I, I sense that uh, portions of the Sunni population are wanting to join the political process. Uh, there is still, however, uh, a goodly number of insurgents there who continue with the, the murder and the intimidation campaign. Uh, that's making it difficult for those people who want to join a, a free and, and hopefully democratic Iraq. So uh, it, it is a, it is a, a region that uh, is in turmoil uh, and in some regards uh, in, in conflict with itself. And we're starting to see that, as a matter of fact, in some of the reporting, where uh, even some of the, the Sunni elements are, are starting to uh, have conflict with each other over which direction the province should go. General, if I could follow up on that, uh, one of the key elements in the Fallujah campaign was the follow-on, having reconstruction ready, sealing off the city so bad guys couldn't get back in. Uh, is this operation to be modeled on that? It's too early to say. Uh, and there are many differences that would make it unlikely. Uh, you don't have the, the, uh, the, the major metropolitan area that Fallujah is uh, out there, a number of smaller towns and villages. So uh, certainly I think in, in the wake of uh, the successful effort there, we will see civil affairs people re-engage, gain the credibility and, and contact with the community. Uh, but, but likely not on a scale that we saw in Fallujah. General, have there been any recent assessments about the size and sophistication of the insurgency throughout Iraq? And is there a sense now that the biggest threat is becoming for foreign fighters? Yeah, I've seen nothing uh, that would indicate either of those things. Okay. Is uh, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi uh, a target of this operation? And is it expected that he, is it believed that he's in this area? And even if he's not the target, is it, is it possible that he might be uh, picked up in an operation? Yes. Uh, he, he is not specifically a target. Uh, again, there was a sighting uh, with him out in that region not long ago. Uh, it would be a welcome uh, event uh, to come across him uh, or his body and, and uh, find him in that region, but that's, uh, that's not the purpose of the operation. Uh, General, following up on the earlier question about uh, Al Anbar province, there was a report that the governor was uh, kidnapped today and that this may be part of a tit-for-tat kidnapping between a clan that supports the coalition and a clan that supports Zarqawi. 
can you shed any light on that? And is that part of what you were talking about earlier about some some cracks in the in the opposition? Uh, the answer to that last question is no. Uh, and in fact, you may have more information than I do based on what you just said. My initial reports from our uh, watch cell uh, is that the governor and his son uh, were kidnapped uh, on 9 May uh, en route from Kaim uh, back to Ramadi. Uh, that uh, members of his family uh, are engaged in discussion, and that's about all we know at this point. Can I follow right. up on that, that point? Sure. Did the governor ask the U.S. military to provide him with protection? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I can say not that I'm aware of. Uh, but as a general matter, we don't discuss personal security matters like that. Could you back to Brack for a second? I'm not going to have for you, Brian, <laughs> but well, you can this try. This is more of a process question. Um, you said this week. Mm -hmm. Can you give us any insight as to whether the Secretary will brief Congress before this is made public or before it goes to the um, commission? <laughs> I would say that it is a principle of our, uh, of, of, of how we sequence all of this that uh, we do our very best to let members of Congress know what the recommendations will look like before anybody else knows. That is a principle. We are going to work very hard to achieve that objective. Uh, and, and then, uh, you know, I recognize that you do your best on something like that. But it is, it is one of the principal objectives of how we sequence, how we talk about this, that members of Congress, to the maximum extent that we're capable of doing, will hear about it from us. That will be like the day before or the day of? <laughs> it will be before. There, there are separate subjects. Back to you, Tony. Separate subject. There are allegations that at least two Army recruiters in Denver and Houston may have acted improperly. In one case, uh, one recruiter was said to make a threat against a potential recruit. Uh, what can you tell us about this? Is there an investigation? And is it true that there's a system wide review of recruiting? Do you have anything on that? I do not. I've seen press reports to that, and we'll try and provide a little additional information. I think these were Army recruiters, is that right? And uh, when we, if we can get some more information, I would suggest you maybe talk to the Army, but at the moment we don't have any more beyond what we've seen in the press. But, but is it true that there is a system-wide review of recruiting? We've been told that that is Yeah, I don't know. Okay. I simply don't know. Tony. Uh, Brett, could you, can the Department release the transcript that the Secretary had last week with editorial writers? Uh, we've gotten some secondhand accounts of what he allegedly said about the extent of the closures. Uh, the building hasn't released the transcript. A, can you do that? And B, can you give a sense of what, a, what is the latest figure on excess capacity that the department is looking at? The secretary, a couple years ago, in a report, said about 25 percent. Is there? Can you give a ballpark of what's the um, figure? First of all, on the question of the transcript, let me think about it. Uh, <laughs> routinely it's been about we a do week. don't we we don't there's nothing routine about base realignment and closure let me assure you talk to reporters and they've <laughs> used it they've melted yeah i take the point let me think about it the yeah. the uh the secretary has said from here uh that there have been estimates over the years uh there was one in the late 90s there was another one done in the last year or two or three i don't remember exactly when that suggests based on certain ways to measure it and it's 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 an imprecise measurement that that some the people responsible for that have estimated we have a 20 to 25 percent excess capacity and then the question becomes what is capacity et cetera he has also said that he expects that we'll be we'll end up in this process uh for a variety of factors that uh, are reasons we'll end up uh shy of that lower range and a lower number in that range and i think that that's probably the way this thing's going to come out but again we're going to have something to say on this in in finite detail within within no more than six days, and, and at that point, it'll all be as understandable as it can be. Get the transcript out. <laughs> Great. Back on El uh, Anbar province on, an, on another issue, could you talk about what kind of requests you might have received for assistance from the Japanese government uh, of the U.S. military in regards to the Japanese citizen who's been reported kidnapped there, and then um, what, if any, assistance have U.S. military forces been able to provide? Do you know anything about that? Um, I, I know about the kidnapping. I don't know anything about requests for assistance. I don't have anything for you on that. Uh, it, seems, it seems that there's been a spike of uh, the d detention of American journalists over in Iraq. I wonder if uh, the posture that the U.S. military is taking towards U.S. journalists over there has changed, the unembedded journalists. Um, do, do you have any intelligence that uh, um, maybe uh, insurgents are trying to infiltrate foreign media organizations over there. What's going on? Yeah, the, well, I, first of all, I'm not sure I know enough to know whether there's a spike or not. I do know that uh, we have th that, that let me just describe the practical circumstances, which I think most of the folks who have represented here who have fo uh, colleagues over there understand. Uh, 
these operations happen, military operations. A lot of times uh, there are journalists who are local hires who uh, rush to one scene or the other that's involved, and uh, military uh, personnel are making rapid decisions uh, on a spot, you know, in, in part to achieve their mission, in part to defend their own lives. Uh, there have been circumstances that we know about where journalists have, or, or uh, terrorists have, or insurgents have been, uh, have, uh, have uh, pretended to be journalists, or we found journalist paraphernalia and captured caches, et cetera. It all adds to the to the split second decisions that are often made. And and there have been instances where we've scooped up people that were at the scene and had to sort it out later uh, after interrogations. There have been instances where we've, after interrogations, decided that some of these folks that have represented themselves uh, in one capacity might be something else. So I, I wouldn't say that there's been a change in posture. There is, uh, we're clearly dealing with an insurgency where that kind of activity is possible. It has been seen, and the objective is that these guys, first and foremost, the rules of engagement always allow them to defend themselves. So, th we're we, the commanders or the uh, multinational force Iraq public affairs people are try and maintain a very regular communication with the bureaus, uh, with the reporters who are stationed in Baghdad and elsewhere to make sure that there is as much transparency as there can be. I think they're very sensitive to that, but again, it's a tough, tough problem. There's been, I wouldn't say there's been a change in policy, because the policy is kind of what I've described. They defend themselves. Uh, they understand there's going to be journalists in the area, and they try and be careful, but they're going to always want to achieve the mission and defend themselves as their Have first warnings priority. been sent to the frontline troops, the folks outside the wire who might be dealing with unembedded journalists? Have warnings been sent to those troops that, there's a new threat, or you need to be more vigilant about looking at people who are who are uh, appear to be journalists. I mean, and not that I'm aware of. Do you know anything? Not about specifically. That? No. No. General, General, when you mentioned that there had been a Zarqawi sighting recently, are you talking about in the last week, ten days, or are you talking about an incident back in February? Uh, I think it's probably been within the last three weeks. Whereabouts? Uh, in the West. Uh, out vicinity between uh, Al Qaim and Huseyba, that region. Yeah, of course, there's no way to ver verify that, so that's somebody's belief. I mean, it's it's. I'd be real careful with that. It's just. Called in. I don't know that we have. Is that much. a sighting by U.S. military? Or by a tip called into the hotline, or what? You know, I don't know how it came. Uh, we, we get lots of Zarqawi sightings, as you might imagine, with a $25 million price tag on his head. North Korean issues. North Korea is known to make nuclear tests in the middle of June. What is the United States depends, Department of Defense countermeasure against the North Korea nuclear test? I, I don't, I don't, you've, uh, you're saying that the North Koreans have announced they're going to do that? Yes. Well, I'm not aware of that, and we'll, we'll wait and see what happens, I suppose. Do you have any uh, sources from North Korea? Well, thing? certainly we don't, I mean, if you're asking me, do we have, int am I prepared to discuss any intelligence matters from the podium, the answer is no. Uh, North Korea is a country that, by its actions every day, seems to be further isolating itself. Uh, it, is, uh, it, is the, it is the U.S. government's view that the best thing for North Korea would be to rejoin the six-party talks. That's the approach that the president and other, his, uh, our, our other uh, partners in the six-party talks believe is the best approach. Um, and then we'll just wait and see how North Korea chooses to respond to that offer. Yes, sir. Uh, General, on these, the uniforms that you mentioned, <laughs> um, first, could you describe them? Are these like old Iraqi military uniforms? Or are they are they from somewhere else? And, and, and second, does their presence of a uniformed armed force on a battlefield give, give particularly if they're foreign fighters, give them extra legal rights? I mean, are they, uh, in, if they're captured under, under the Geneva Conventions, then, then a you know, a typical Ford and fighter receives. Yeah, I, what, what I expressed to you was one line out of one report that talked about some insurgents wearing uniforms. Uh, and I think the answer to your second question is no, uh, in that it is not uh, an organized army per, per se uh, as a result of, of whatever spotting. But, but this is not, we're not going to do Geneva on the fly. Mm -hmm. we, we will be prepared, I will be happy to provide you the, the assessment, but as a practical matter, the conflict with Iraq is governed by the Geneva Conventions, and we've, we've said that. And then, there's always questions about individuals who are detained and, and establishing their status, and we have procedures for establishing status within Geneva, and we follow those procedures carefully. Last question or two, maybe. We'll go to the back. Yeah, the Marine Corps is in the process of trying to gather up about 5,000 outer tactical vests that may have failed uh, ballistics tests, uh, and there are as many as 19,000 total that may be out there. Uh, is the department involved at all in that, or is that strictly a Marine Corps uh, 
the situation in general as a, as a Marine? Are you concerned at all that there may be Marines who are wearing less than uh, less than uh, proper uh, protection? Well, it, it, and if the Marine Corps is involved, the department is certainly involved. Uh, but the answer is no. Uh, I, uh, I have read some on this. I've had some discussion uh, with some of my counterparts. Um, there were vests that, that were tested. Uh, the number is down to just over 5,000 vests that uh, on the one hand, uh, failed a test, but when they were retested, they were fine. Uh, it is dealing with the vest, uh, per se, and its ability to stop 9 millimeter or fragmentation rounds. Quite frankly, every Marine that wears the vest in Iraq or Afghanistan wears it with the sappy plate, so in some regards, it's almost a moot argument. Uh, those vests, uh, the Marine Corps has uh, called back uh, simply because of what might be concerns on, on the part of the troops or their families uh, to make sure there's absolutely no uh, cause alarm and and the aggregate of those 5,000 vests are something less than 3% of the total so in my mind uh, the right thing has been done pretty much at every step of the way uh, and it, uh, it it should be yesterday's news a quick status question the uh, suicide bombing at Mosul in December we still we haven't heard the final investigative results do you have any insight there it's been over six months now yeah, I, I'm sorry I do not have you heard anything uh, I, I, not a, is it been concluded what's the status of it it's, it's under review by it's under review by the by general casey is that correct it's, it's under review final, by general casey the final reports under review the investigation so okay. i think i think the way that worked is we had uh help me out here general uh, it was uh, general jacoby was it Formica. Formica. general Formica did an investigation at the request of general ham and that re investigation, as I understand it, has been concluded by the investigating officer, but the process allows for higher echelon commanders to review it and accept their not findings and move it on from there, and that's where it stands at the moment, okay, is it's with the commander. Thank you very much, folks. Well, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you.